Ah, Dabo, you're a winner. Barely. Chase Price uh, pulling through in the clutch despite some uh, very uh, shaky moments as he came into the game for Trevor Lawrence in uh, the second quarter, late in the second quarter, and then played, obviously, the second half and pulled out the victory as Clemson was down by two scores in this one to Syracuse, 23-13. to Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, breaking down the noon games, and this one was a very big and the biggest of the selection of games at noon because of a number of things. Clemson on the ropes, Trevor Lawrence in the locker room injured. We talked about it during our halftime analysis as Clemson went to the locker room. At that point, I don't remember the score. <laughs> I don't remember what the score was at halftime. I know that, that it was close. I believe uh, actually Syracuse was up. Yes, yeah, 16 to 7 at halftime. As I don't even have my notes in front of me, I left them over there. All right, Syracuse up 16 to 7. Trevor Lawrence in the locker room. Chase Bryce's uh, first several series were shaky at best. Uh, we mentioned it right out of the gate in the second half that Clemson would rely on its running game. Travis Etienne had a career high in rushing yards. He was a battering ram, a burst, a dynamo in the running game, and the offensive line took control of this game. I thought it would take hold on the very first drive of the third quarter that they got their locker room speech, that they knew what the challenge was of breaking in a new quarterback and not having to rely on him, but the offensive line in the running game. But they came out and they got stopped on that first drive after uh, delivering on a few uh, third down conversions. But uh, man, what a game. What a game. Excellent game. Would love to hear from you, 860-325-3687. I will carve through the numbers and the results from Saturday. And I know Dabo's proud of his team. I know he's proud of them coming back. They were down 23-13 in the fourth quarter. And once the guys get on the field, it doesn't matter how many stars they had in the recruiting rankings. But there is a talent advantage that he has. Decidedly, it's not even close against Syracuse. Syracuse was on the road. I would be extremely proud if I was a Syracuse fan and Dino Baber should be very proud. The, certainly they had the game in hand at 23-13. They had scored the touchdown after the fumbled punt and Syracuse was in great position and uh, Clemson took it away from them. So yes, uh, it's disappointing for Syracuse, but Man, I would be mighty proud of that football team coming back against a team that had that big revenge factor, considering what happened last year in the Dome. To come back today as a twenty-five point under, uh, twenty-five point favorite, and just blow them out. So Syracuse played well. I need to go to my notes. You guys go crazy on the chat here. Uh, we're not going to be on for long. I just wanted to get out a, a few comments about uh, the big Clemson win over Syracuse and everything else that's going on at noon. With all the games going on. I thought we had a great, excellent halftime of the Clemson-Syracuse game. So check that out. We had some really good phone calls and good discussion about the Bryant-Lawrence situation. And now Lawrence Hurt with uh, Chase Bryce coming in and relieving him. And he pulled through in the second half in the fourth quarter in the final few minutes in particular. And we'll talk about that again in just a second. Yes, what a game, Dennis. Final drive of the game for Clemson. They're down 23-20 at that point. You could go the conservative route and say, let's kick a field goal, go to overtime, and uh, put it in the hands of the defense to a particular point. Fourth and one. Key situation, key decision for Dabo Sweeney. Fourth and one, and his right guard jumped. Decidedly jumped way before the snap. Pushes it back to a fourth and six. There's under three minutes left to play. What do you do? You're at midfield. You're down three. It's 250 on the clock. You're at fourth and six. The down and distance is not favorable with a freshman or a first year quarterback. First time playing significant time. Dabo went for it. And 
chase Bryce through a dart. It was brilliant. It was between three guys. It was on time. It was on target. It was anticipated. It was a tremendous throw to T Higgins that split the coverage to the 32 yard line. Then he ran for 17 yards on the RPO read. And then Tavian Feaster went for 13 yards after a blown up play by the Syracuse front on the next uh, play. But Feaster, 13 yards to the five. Syracuse let the clock run. Not necessarily the smartest move by Dino Babers on the day. He prepared his team extremely well. He did not manage the clock well on the final drive. And that's a difficult situation. I understand you can go. We kill the clock here. We give the offense no timeouts, or we see if they score. We get the ball back, and we've got timeouts. 860-325-3687. It's Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, following the big Clemson win over Syracuse. Who's on the line? DeAndre, how you doing, Mark? DeAndre, you got to be feeling good. Maybe the heart's pumping a little bit right now. Yeah, I was trying to go to sleep. I had to work my second job yesterday. Oh. And I was like, I had to stay up and watch it. I mean, I, um, I'm still kind of disappointed that Dabo and Kelly Bryan couldn't work something out because of this, this reason right here. Um, Lawrence getting hurt, but uh, Bryce didn't play good. But um, the secondary for Clemson still worries me. I would tell them, Pisky and Pete and Bobby uh, Dickens, uh, Rickens, I don't know his name. Uh, another Clemson fan that does YouTube. And, um, uh, I was always worried about that, and it got exposed a little bit, but they're going to have to approve or find some depth from somewhere when they get up to uh, playing NC State um, and a couple other teams that can throw the ball down the field. Not um, too many teams, though. you got to wake on the schedule. They're not throwing it too well. Boston College had the one big game in the passing game against Wake, but they don't throw it too well with Anthony Brown. Yes, Ryan Finley and those wide receivers at NC State, probably your biggest threat to deal with. Daniel Jones is decent in the passing game, but not great. That's your game. The South Carolina wide receivers are really good. Um, right. So you've got a couple games there, yeah. Well, you know, Mark, I watch it uh... – Carolina and um, Miami Thursday. Sure. Why did everybody think that Mitch Trubisky is the calls that Carolina was winning a few years ago, and it was Marvin Williams, and not Mitch. Mitch. Mitch didn't win anything while he was at Carolina. They didn't get to the ACC championship game. I know that irritates me because he couldn't beat Mar uh, Marvin Williams at all. I don't think he's a very good quarterback. And um, and I, that just irritates me every time I watch Carolina play. You know, it was Marvin Williams, not Mr. Fitzgerald that were doing anything at Carolina at that time. I know it was a little bit off subject, but I'll try to call you that day about it, but I didn't have a chance to. So I'm guessing and, what um, irritates you, DeAndre, is that people less knowledgeable about you and I just assume that it was Trubisky at quarterback when they went to the ACC championship game. Is that what you're irritated about, that, they, yeah. that the information's incorrect? Right. Everybody can't, even the commentators on ESPN, I'm sitting there like, Mitch Trubisky didn't do anything. I mean, Carolina still was terrible, but it wasn't Mitch Trubisky that was called the Carolina, was, was Carolina success on the door. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, I'll make a distinction there. You are correct that Marquise Williams, Marquise, just to clarify there, Marquise Williams was the quarterback for Carolina when they won the division and went to the ACC championship game. They played a really good game, I think, 45-37 against Clemson, the team that went to the national championship game in 2015. Uh, they got steamrolled in a bowl game by Baylor. Anyway, Trubisky was the quarterback the next year. They were roughly in the same category. They didn't win the division the next year. Let's see, 2016 was the... Um, Clemson, Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech won the division that year when Trubisky was the North Carolina quarterback, and that's the only season he started at Carolina. They were good. They were comparable to the team before, but Williams just happened to be the quarterback when they won the title. But they weren't any worse of a team the next year with well, Trubisky at quarterback. Who beat them 34-3 that year? Who beat them 34-3? Uh, Virginia Tech. That, uh, yeah, they did. Yes, they, they did. Good, good team. Georgia, Georgia, I think Georgia beat them too. But back to the Clemson win, Mark, yes. I was just so happy. 
Um, I wish, like I said, I met Dabo. I heard um, your man on the Southland uh, say uh, Dabo didn't have to do what he did. And I totally agree because he could have uh, still rotated them. Um, I know Lawrence, everybody's expecting Lawrence to do big things. But Lawrence needs to understand um, he's still a freshman. You know what I'm saying? And you're going to have games like this. And luckily, Bryce was able to step in and that, they was able to run the uh, football. I don't know what's wrong with our right side of our line. So they will get killed early in the game by 17. But uh, hopefully we can work it out. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the college football day. I'm going to leave you alone. And uh, you have a great day, Mark. DeAndre, we thank you so much and appreciate it. And glad that uh, your Clemson Tigers pulled through, at least for you. Yes, sir. Uh, Syracuse is a real good program, man. I I, 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 I was a kid. I remember how good Syracuse were. I think it was Matt Pearson, Donovan Nab, sure. and people like that. Marvin Graves. Run a, yep. They used to run that multiple offense. They beat Clemson in their bowl like 24 0, I believe. I think it was like the Hall of Fame bowl. They did. Around at that time. Yes, they did. Yeah, so, you know, they were, they were really good. That's a really good program. I mean, people don't respect. Uh, Syracuse football program like they should, but I don't think they really realize how good it was. I mean, they had um, Jim Brown. Um, Jim Brown, I mean, Ernie Davis. Absolutely. Larry Zonka. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they, uh, I mean, they, they don't have a lot of talent. I mean, they, I mean it, it's just a shame that they, for some reason their program has fell on hard time and Dino Bray is trying to get them back. But um, I think the reason why you see them fall a hard time because you see the rise of little schools like Connecticut and Rhode Island. I know they're not that good, but, you know, at one point, Connecticut was, like, decent. And, you know, people like, uh, who was the defensive end that played with the Colts? I think he's from Connecticut. You're talking um, about Dwight Freeney. Freeney. Yeah, Dwight Freeney. Uh, he was from Connecticut. He played at uh, Syracuse. And there yes. was a lot of talent from that, those areas, but. You know, New York had a great football talent, but they dominated the Northeast. They recruited for a long period of time. They got some players out of Florida, and that's what made Syracuse special. But for some reason, that have fell off. Because um, I don't think people were traveling that far north from Florida anymore to uh, Syracuse. But I think Syracuse is on the right track. And I just wait, wait to see what Dino Davis does from now on with that program. It sure looks like it. Work. Thanks, DeAndre. Yeah, we appreciate sir. it. You You take care. It's our guy, DeAndre. Uh, We appreciate his support. He comes on and is a Clemson fan, but uh, really hones in on the ACC in particular, but loves college football as well, as we all do. Uh, Clemson survived Syracuse 27-23. A loss would not have been the end of the world, but obviously would have provided Clemson with zero margin of error. We would think because we've been through four years of the college football playoff and no two loss team has made it to the playoff. So it's going to happen at some point. I guarantee that over the next 10 years, there are going to be two loss teams make the playoff, but we have yet to see it now. So right now it's kind of a death knell for a team losing a second game. So Syracuse or um, Clemson avoids that issue. And let's, let's be balanced here. Syracuse is in the running for a college football playoff and a division championship. They now need Clemson to lose twice, but they are four and one on the season. And as DeAndre notes, this is a much improved football team. Now we'll see if they're able to carry this through after they upset Clemson at home last year, they were not able to continue the play uh, at that level. And they lost to the rest of their games to finish at four and eight. So Dino Babers in his first two years, had significant wins over ranked Virginia Tech and Clemson teams, but he finished four and eight both seasons, two and six in the conference. This team gets off to a 4-0 start. They beat the teams that they were supposed to beat and Florida State included by 23 points. So they get a win that we didn't think that they were going to get preseason. They play this well on the road at Clemson. I understand the Clemson quarterback situation with Trevor Lawrence, but even when Lawrence was in the game, Syracuse was out playing at Clemson. They outplayed them most of this game. The better team won. But Syracuse uh, with some hope here, definitely. They've got Eric Dungy at quarterback. We knew that. Their wide receivers were making plays downfield. Jamal Custis in particular. They were 
not able to run the ball, but that's not necessarily a concern because who runs the ball against Clemson much? And uh, Syracuse moves on from there. All right, uh, I'm going to catch the 330 games. I wanted to go through a few things here real quick. I want to see how we wrapped up in Dallas with Texas A&M and Arkansas. was keeping my eye on this one. And yes, A&M holds off Arkansas 24 to 17. So the Yankees move on to three and two. The Hogs fall to one and four. And those Arkansas fans, again, they told me that they were going to be seven, eight or nine game winners this year. Please uh, respond to your comments, calling me a moron and an idiot for telling you that Arkansas was going to win four or five games max this year. All right, a light day in the SEC, but we have two nice matchups in the evening, followed by a late night matchup with Ole Miss LSU. But of course, it's Florida, Mississippi State, and a key matchup in the SEC Eastern Division, South Carolina, Kentucky. Uh, I like uh, Florida plus the seven points. I like Kentucky plus the two and uh, LSU to cover 10 points at home against Ole Miss. We have Georgia, Tennessee kicking off Louisville, Florida State. Let's see who's the worst out of Louisville and Florida State. Key matchup over the last five years in the SC, in the ACC Atlantic Division. Uh, now just a, a play for survival between the Cardinals and uh, the Knowles. Sad state of affairs in Tallahassee and in Louisville. Let's uh, notice also, of course, that uh, Alabama romps in a big way. 56-14. I needed them to cover 49. That's why I stay away from those stupid point spreads that are way too high because it really doesn't matter what the final score is. So I may stop predicting those games. Michigan State couldn't cover Central Michigan. I predicted Central Michigan plus the 29 points. So that's good. Uh, Michigan State I didn't see the game by the looks of the score. Not necessarily impressive. Beating Central Michigan 31-20. to 20. Uh, Michigan State, of course, and now at 3-1. and one. Brian Lewerke, 16 of 25 for a buck 85 and a pick through new touchdown passes. Ladarius Jefferson, 13 carries for 56. Hunter Hayward, 15 for 48. So Michigan State could not run the ball against Central Michigan. Michigan State. Could not run the ball against Central Michigan today. 47 carries for a buck 60. That's 3.4 per carry. Forget the four touchdowns rushing. 3.4 yards per carry for Michigan State. So let's point out what really matters at noon. What can we take from the noon games? Well, we can take the Chase Bryce was shaky early and then pulled through like a champion in delivering a fourth and six and some other passes downfield in the final drive in the final two drives as Clemson came back from 23, 13 down to win in 27, 23. So chase Bryce Clemson looking good right now, at least for the moment. Now he's going to get the first team reps and the practice time, most likely depending on the status of Trevor Lawrence. So Clemson survives and they move on. We can take good things away from the Syracuse performance. Again, able to compete downfield uh, in the passing game. Sure, the offensive line had issues protecting Eric Dungy, but we know the Clemson fronts and NFL front, so it's difficult to evaluate there. That would be, I think, the difference in this football game is that Eric Dungy was running for his life. He did not have the support of a running game in this uh, matchup with Clemson, and he was running around like a fool because of the Clemson defensive front, maybe not getting a lot of sacks, but they pressured him nonstop. Dungy goes 26 of 41 for 250 and a pick. In the running game, nothing for Syracuse. Uh, Sean Riley, two for 24. Yeah, he had a 19-yard run. But besides that, 26 for 61. 2.3 yards per carry for the Syracuse rushing attack. Jamal Custis was really impressive in making some plays downfield on the Clemson secondary, five catches, 73 yards. Devin Butler at the end of the first half to set up that last field goal to make it 16-7. to seven. Had some uh, exceptional plays downfield, five catches, 45 yards for Syracuse as the Orange fall to 4-1. and one. We did potentially have some drama in Lubbock with Texas Tech and West Virginia. The Mountaineers got out of the gate. They led 21-0. They led 28-7. Will Greer was having his field day against Texas Tech at that point, throwing for 174 yards in the first quarter, in the first quarter, 
and throwing some lasers. I saw Will Greer throw five balls that are going to be as good practically as anything that I see tomorrow on Sunday. And uh, I turned away from the game. I thought it was going to be the best game at noon, certainly the most important game at noon. I didn't expect Syracuse to challenge Clemson. But uh, 21 nothing, 28 7, I turned away from it. Then I catch this thing late. Texas Tech had the ball. They had come within 35 27. 35 27 with the ball with about three minutes left. But they threw a pick six. And West Virginia took it home there. It's 42 27. Tech with the ball, 53 seconds left. They've got to score twice in 50 seconds. And I don't know where they've got the ball, but it's uh, pretty much a lost cause as, again, West Virginia gets the pick six from, I believe that was uh, Kenny Robinson with a pick six. West Virginia's got three picks today, two by Kenny Robinson. Actually, that was Keith Washington with a pick six for the Mountaineers against Texas Tech, and that's been the difference in the game. Three picks by West Virginia, one a pick six when Tech was driving at midfield to take the lead. After being down 35 to 10, Texas Tech showed some fight, came back within 35 27, but West Virginia is safe right now. 53 seconds left at 40, 42 27. Will Greer has taken his foot off the throttle, 27 to 41 for 370. Three touchdowns, still a big day out of the best quarterback in the country, I would say. Marcus Sims, nine catches, 138 yards for the Mountaineers. Gary Jennings, seven for 70. Those guys were two of the more prolific wide receivers in the nation last year. And certainly David Sills, who led the nation in touchdown catches. Uh, four for 48. As West Virginia is going to move this uh, record on now to 4-0 and on the season. Oklahoma's got a quick score on Baylor. They lead 7-0. Of course, Austin Kendall got the start because it was just announced before kickoff. We knew that Kyler Murray was not going to get the start. We found that out earlier today. Kyler Murray was late for practice on Friday. His discipline was not starting. Austin Kendall's got the start for Oklahoma. We'll see how long he plays. The Sooners a 21-point favorite against Baylor today. Pitt, Central Florida. Central Florida with the ball early. Nine minutes left in the first quarter. Uh, Tennessee, please hang on for me. I got plus 31. Tennessee, Georgia, the Bulldogs with the ball early, already driving in, at the Tennessee 31. Texas, Kansas State just opened up. Let me see if there's anything else I've got. Man, I got to go through my notes. Man, I don't take these notes for nothing. And while I got a few people on the line, let's see if anything I say here and what really stood out to me in the early noon games means anything to you. And then we'll settle in on these 330 games. Will Greer has now thrown for 300 yards 13 times in 15 starts for West Virginia on fire early and apparently for the rest of the game for West Virginia as the Mountaineers lead this 42 now 33 as Tech lines up for the kick. Still not to, going to be good enough with 35 seconds left in the game. Beautiful pass to Gary Jennings on the, on the first drive of the game for a touchdown. Uh, Texas Tech came into the game with the number one pass offense in the nation. If you're just looking at uh, gross statistics, 389 yards per game. And in this one, actually, Alan Bowman, who did not look good the first few drives of the game, was pulled. He was 9 for 20, unless he got hurt for 120 yards. Jeff Duffy, who he battled in August camp for the job, Jeff Duffy has come into the game. He has thrown two picks, including the pick six that we talked about. Duffy, 16 of 27 for a buck 72. So actually, uh, Tech throwing for 295 through the air today. They lead the nation at 389 yards per game. We got to see Kenny Bigelow playing defensive tackle for um, uh, West Virginia, the transfer from USC and one of the top defensive linemen in the Pac-12 and saw him make some plays and, and cause some disruptive plays in the first half. I noticed that for um, the Mountaineers. Bowman, again, with some bad passes, deflected interception to Kenny Robinson, who has two picks for West Virginia. His guys didn't help him out the first few drives of the game as West Virginia took a 21 to nothing lead. Antoine Wesley, uh, Jadeon High had drops for Texas Tech, couldn't hold on to the ball. 
Again, the, one of the prettiest plays you're going to see in the passing game this weekend. Greer to Marcus Sims. Catch the highlight. It was beautiful. Beautiful on both ends. All right. Uh, I'm mixing up notes of games. Syracuse, Clemson. Clemson's field goal kicking, even though Greg Hugel has owned the job for quite some time, he is still shaky. He missed his first field goal attempt today, 47-yarder. At that point on the season, he was three for six, and he's had the job for quite some time. Uh, the Texas A&M punter. If, you, if you're looking for a punter, if you play any fantasy college football, you're looking for a punter. The Texas A&M punter don't have his name right now. He has been remarkable. Um, let's see. Anything else on Clemson and uh, Syracuse? Kellen Mond threw some costly interceptions today, but of course, in the end, didn't cost the team. They win by a touchdown against Arkansas. So AM is three and two, but threw a red zone interception to Dre uh, Greenlaw with a score at 17 to seven. Could have broken it open, been in good shape. Uh, Dre Greenlaw had two picks in the first half. There was an interesting story on Dre Greenlaw, linebacker for Arkansas, and a um, uh, family situation in which he was taken in by a a nice family. Uh, good uh, story there. I mentioned uh, Clemson uh, linebacker, um, defensive player, Isaiah Simmons. I noticed him being all over the field, making plays all over the field, explosive player. Jamal Custis, again, impresses me with uh, making a tremendous plays down the field. A uh, big third and long conversion uh, at the end of the first half that converted uh, a Syracuse drive that ended in a field goal. Travis Etienne had a career high in rushing. Career high in rushing for Travis Etienne. Let's check that out real quick. Travis, Travis Etienne in this game. Ran 27 times for 203 yards. Adam Choice, 9 for 58. Tavian Feaster, 9 for 44. But a big third down conversion late in the game for Feaster down to the five-yard line before the touchdown play. But Etienne was a monster. Three touchdowns, 27 carries for 203. And Bryce, again, uh, came into the game, didn't look good, but uh, really the last two drives of the game played well. He had a bad interception in which he underthrew the ball and threw it behind the receiver, didn't hang it out there on the right sideline. It was picked off by a, a very impressive player, freshman Trill Williams for Syracuse. He had a pick. He also had some really good pass breakups in this game. Williams in the secondary freshman out of Yonkers, Playing for Syracuse, look out for him down the road. Bryce finishes uh, 7 of 13 for 83 yards and a pick, the pick we talked about. All right, uh, anything else? Justin Ross on the fourth quarter drive that got uh, Syracuse close. There was basically four big plays in the drive. Etienne converted two for first downs. The last two plays of the drive, 17-yard run, 26-yard run for the TD. Justin Ross, the prized recruit freshman, two huge catches on that drive to convert first downs from 16 and 15 yards out with eight minutes left to play to make it 23-20. And, uh, of course, we outlined the final drive for Syracuse or for Clemson, the final two drives as they go from 23-13 down to the lead at 27 to 23. Eric Dungy only had 40 seconds. He had bad field position. He had a uh, unnecessary roughness call, hands to the face from his left guard. And that killed them, put them in a bad position. Then he gets sacked. He had no protection. Game over. When Clemson's defensive front knows that you have to throw, then that makes it brutally difficult for any offense and there was no way that Syracuse was going to march it down the field in 40 seconds against that defense in that situation to win the game. Anything else in FBS play that strikes you guys? I'll check out the chat before I leave. And if anybody wants to call in, it's 860-325-3687. Georgia scored. They're up seven zip. 
Tennessee's got the ball at its own 30. Oklahoma with a first down at the Baylor 30. And they're up seven to nothing already. Kyler Murray has come into the game. So obviously he wasn't out for even the first quarter. He probably missed the first drive or the first play. One of those technicalities. Kyler Murray, three for three, 25 yards passing and a touchdown. So it would be officially in the books that Austin Kendall would get the start and the win. If you keep track of quarterback starting records, Austin Kendall gets the win for Oklahoma. Central Florida scores on Pitt. Extra point is good. 7-0. Mackenzie Milton, 4 for 7, 86 yards. Adrian Killens already has two catches for 69 yards for UCF. Texas scores on Kansas State on its first drive. It's 7-0 with five minutes left in the first quarter. Uh, Sam Ellinger, four for seven, early 21 yards. Uh, Alabama rolls 56-14. Do any numbers matter from that game? Really not. Oklahoma did uh, drive it in to go up 14 to nothing on Baylor. Tua went eight for eight, left the game, two touchdown passes. Ho-hum. Jalen Hurts, four for six for a buck 18 and a touchdown. Mac Jones threw a touchdown. They gave the ball to everybody at running back. Najee Harris had 11 carries, 72 yards. Brian Robinson, 12 for 65. Josh Jacobs ran it four times or six times. And all sorts of running backs. Damien Harris only had to carry the ball five times. Uh, Jalen Waddell had a big day, three catches for a buck 38 and two touchdowns. Henry Ruggs, five catches for a buck 16 and two touchdowns. Okay, there you go. Trevon Diggs had a pick. So did Xavier McKinney for the Alabama Crimson Tide. As we mentioned, Michigan State barely holds off Central Michigan. I ran down the rushing numbers. Those could be of a concern for Sparty. Facing Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State down the road. They can only run against Central Michigan 3.4 yards per carry. Issue. That would be an issue. I'm curious on this. I was checking out. It was my third screen at North Carolina State and Virginia. What happened? Wake leads Rice 14-0. Louisville scored on its first drive 7-0 on FSU. BC gets by Temple 45-35. There it is. NC State defeated Virginia 35-21. I knew that was a good play. I should have taken it. NC State was a six-point favorite. I thought that they would win somewhat comfortably in this one. Let's see. Ryan Finley, workmanlike, 22 for 32 for 257, three touchdowns. Ricky Person had a nice game for NC State, 14 carries for 108. Reggie Gillespie, 14 for 47. Kelvin Harmon doing work there. 1,000-yard receiver last year for NC State. Nine, six catches, 94 yards. Amika Amizi, five for 90. A touchdown as well. Jacoby Myers, four catches for NC State. NC State now 4-0. Now they're finally going to play somebody here soon. They should have played West Virginia a couple weeks ago. The Hurricane wiped that out. So for NC State coming up, listen to this. NC State now has Boston College, Clemson on the road, Syracuse on the road, FSU, Wake, Louisville, North Carolina. BC, Clemson, Syracuse the next three weeks for NC State. We'll find out about the Wolf Pack in the next three weeks. Bryce Perkins, 20 of 35 for Virginia. And let's see what you guys are talking about. And then we'll watch uh, some 330 football here. Uh, Noah. Mark, do you think Michigan State gets over seven wins this year? I guess we're talking about Michigan State, MSU, since that's who I was talking about. I picked them to go eight and four, but I did think that they would beat Arizona State and then go five and four in the Big Ten. Now that they've lost to Arizona State, looked like this against Central Michigan, which, again, I didn't see the game. I'll see some highlights. Uh, I would love to be able to go back and watch the game, but I don't have that kind of time with uh, all these other uh, college football games going on. But uh, Michigan State 
they're losing to Michigan and Penn State and Ohio State, I believe. They didn't dominate Indiana, but they were clearly the better team. They led by one to two scores for that game. I thought that that might be a hiccup for them at Indiana, but they weathered that storm. I do know that they've got Nebraska, Northwestern. Uh, let's look at the Michigan State schedule. And I will answer your question. I've got to see the schedule and see who they play out of the West. I know that they avoid Wisconsin. Okay, Michigan State. So they're three and one right now. They've got Northwestern at home next week. That's about a 75-25 win. They go to Penn State. That's about a 25-75 loss, meaning percentages. Michigan at home, I think that's like 40-60 against them. Purdue at home, Purdue's played pretty well. They're 1-3, and three, but we know the plight of Purdue football this year. At Maryland, it's not a give me for Michigan State. I think it's 75-25. Ohio State, of course, they most likely lose that game. They finish with Nebraska on the road, which the Huskers could be a different team in six or seven weeks. Let's think about that. The Huskers might be a different team, not a great team. They're not going to win nine games in a row, but they could be a capable team in six or seven weeks under Scott Frost. He may work things out pretty quickly in six or seven weeks. So Michigan State going to Lincoln's not going to be a layup. Rutgers <laughs> scrimmage. Okay. I'm going to stay with five and four in the Big Ten, and they lost a game outside the Big Ten, so that puts them at seven and five. I, I I don't see them beating Penn State, Michigan, and Ohio State, even though they've got two of those three games at home. And then I think they're going to trip up against somebody else. Northwestern's not going to be easy. Purdue's not going to be easy for them. A trip to Maryland is not a gimme. And again, Nebraska could be a much improved football team by November 17th. I got Sparty at seven and five. I'd pick them eight and four preseason. But if you're asking me right now with the Arizona State loss, I go, uh, Mr. Hausler, I go seven and five. But I like to stay with my preseason predictions until they mathematically can't come true. So Michigan State eight and four was the preseason pick. Uh, since the tumor's mad that Clemson won. He hates them. However, Clemson sucks now. They will lose two games before the season is over. You heard it here first. Well, I don't know if we've heard that here first since the tumor, but we heard it from you. Clemson 11-1. and one. I'll stay with my 11-1 and one preseason prediction. Clemson doesn't look good enough to beat Bama. Stanford? West Virginia? Really? Let's not... <laughs> Let's not blow this performance out of proportion. Clemson lost to Syracuse last year. When they won the national championship, they beat Pitt by one, or they lost to Pitt by one point. They lost to Pitt, who lost five games. They lost to Pitt, who lost to Northwestern in a bowl game. They lost to Pitt when they won the national championship. They would not have made the college football playoff if the North Carolina State field goal kicker, bless his soul, uh, I, I'm going to look up his name just so I know it. Uh, I, I forget it. The North Carolina State kicker would have made a 30-yard field goal. Clemson is out of the playoff in 2016. So let's tap the brakes just a little bit. Every week tells us something, but it doesn't tell us everything. And just because Clemson struggles with Syracuse doesn't mean their history. If Clemson shows up tomorrow and plays Stanford on a neutral site, give me Clemson. LSU will crush the baby Tigers. Clemson should lose its place in the top four. Well, Ray, 7337, if you watch Mark Rogers TV, I didn't have them in the top four. Let's get the top 25 that makes sense. The top 25 that means something that's based actually on performance on the field. Clemson's going to take a bit of a hit for that. Yes, they did win the game. They'll get credit. But depending on what other teams do, their number seven ranking is tenuous. 
All right, anything else for you guys? Stick man, matter of fact, I respect Mark too much for this. I'll check you real fans later. Uh, Stick man, I appreciate the respect. Uh, don't know what you guys got into here. Uh, Stick man just wanted to talk some football. Don't know what you guys are talking about. Uh, do we talk about other things in here? I know you guys do sometimes. Uh, oh boy, we got some, uh, some, uh, why are we talking ghetto? All right. Uh, I, I don't know what happened here, but that's fine. Uh, this is the deal. Please respect people in the chat. Talk trash. Trash it up when it comes to college football. But let's, as adults, know where the line is. And the line is a little bit different for each person, but generally where the line is. Don't offend people's backgrounds. Don't offend their families. Don't offend their race, certainly, or their preferences in any other walk of life. Let's offend their college football preferences only. Please, uh, let's respect everyone. All right. I had somebody uh, the other night contact me because they were upset about how they were treated in the chat. And I let them know because I can't control the chat. I either have to shut down the live stream or leave it going. I, those are the only choices I have. Yes, I can look through here. I can sift through here and suddenly block someone. But just because somebody makes a derogatory comment or one slip of the tongue, or even if it's a malicious comment once, I'm not going to block somebody once. Now, if that's a trend, if they're warned, if, they, if they're just out of control uh, on a regular basis, yes, I would block someone out of here. But no, I'm not going to <laughs> go the route of social media uh, public forum style where we condemn everyone for the, the first slip up. All right. The Walking Geek. Clemson is fine if they keep winning. The Walking Geek. I'm going to have to think about that. Clemson's fine if they keep winning. Let's see if they keep winning. They're going to beat them. Then they're going to beat them. Be, let's see. They'll be 7-0. and 10-0. and 0. They keep winning. 12-0. and 0. Then they go to the ACC championship game, and it could be tough. No, that's right. They keep winning. Um, then they are going to go to the college football playoff because they'll be 13-0. and 0. And they should... Yeah, there's no way they're going to win there. Oh, if they keep winning, that's right. So they're going to win the college football playoff game. Then they go to the national championship game. And there's no way I see them with either Lawrence or Bryce winning the national championship game. Oh, if they keep winning, if they keep winning, I guess they're going to win the national championship. All right. They'll, they'll be okay if they keep winning. I don't let you guys off the hook. Let's be smart. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football for the smart fan. That's you. Georgia will be Clemson if they play now, and I'm a Tiger fan. I would think so. It would it would appear so. Mark, who do you have tonight, Stanford or Notre Dame? Well, I do have a preview and a prediction at SG1 Sports that you can check out, but I'll provide you with that, Emmanuel, since you were a faithful viewer. Notre Dame wins this game 26-23. Dabo better go beg Kel Bryant or something. UGA will blow them out. Why are we matching up Georgia and Clemson? Although I kind of matched that up. My college football playoff, of course, was Alabama, Ohio State, Georgia, Clemson. So I, I get it. But, man, that is so far down the road. Clemson just needs to win its games in the Atlantic Division. They've got to beat Duke. All right. I picked Louisville in my pick em league. Uh, we got some hurt feelings, unfortunately. That playoff game was two years ago. Clemson can't win a playoff game without Deshaun Watson. Hmm. NCIS Fanatic 21. Got a point there. Deshaun Watson is 3-1. Clemson is three and two. Therefore, Clemson without Deshaun Watson is 0 and 1. So, for right now, NCIS Fanatic 21, we'll go with your theory. 
Hey, Mark, just wanted to say thanks for all you do. Keep up the good work. Eric, thank you so much. Uh, I don't hear from you often, but if you're just watching and keeping track and watching other channels, whatever you do, I appreciate these comments. Uh, we do our best. We don't know everything. We don't have uh, a perfect ratings or ranking system, but we, we do our best and we think we know what we're talking about. With your help, I learned from you guys too. And uh, we watch college football and love it. Miami's chances of winning the ACC look very different than on lunchtime Thursday. That comes from Adam. Do they really, Adam? Adam, the sports guy. Miami's chances of winning the ACC. So you're talking about the whole conference. Win the division. Win the division. You might be right. I, I get your point. Emmanuel, West Virginia looks better than Clemson. I don't know. I, I don't know that defense, that defensive front will control games. Myers a mess compared to Dabo. Really? Are we talking about Urban Meyer being a mess? Seriously? The guy has the best winning percentage in history post like 1930. Really? Urban Meyer. The, the, these guys should be allowed to lose like one game a year without being too heavily criticized. Sure, his team looked awful in the playoff two years ago. Sure, they looked awful against Iowa, 55-24. But they had the best wins in college football last year up before the playoff. And Urban Meyer is, if you count all the games this year, he's 77-8. At Ohio State, 77 and eight. Dabo Sweeney is a great coach, and maybe he's better today than Urban Meyer is. Maybe. I don't know that. I wouldn't necessarily declare that. But if God came down and told us right now, Nick Saban's the best coach in college football, and Dabo Sweeney's number two right this second, and whoever's third, I would say, okay. But Dabo Sweeney has not put together the resume or the career of Urban Meyer yet. He's got a chance to, but he's not even close. It's not close. <laughs> Urban Meyer's close to Nick Saban because the national championships are tainted and mythical and selection process. If you look at the actual performance on the field from their teams and what they've accomplished, the Urban Meyer-Nick Saban debate is better and more heated and more legitimate than you would think, than, than the national media, the group think, cliched media would make you think. Because if you really grind down the careers of Urban Meyer and Nick Saban, it's a good argument. But the national media, all they do is say, oh, six national championships, three national championships, oh, okay, six to three. That's all they know. And I would be saying this about Urban Meyer if he didn't coach at Ohio State. I'd be saying this about somebody else because I've made these arguments about other situations involving other teams. So it's not an Ohio State thing. Uh, sense of humor, sorry. Somebody is close to Saban right this second, and his name's Urban Meyer. So sometime you can come on here and we can debate, and we're not going to do it right now because I want to go watch football. We can debate Urban Meyer versus Nick Saban. I will gladly do that. And I'm not saying Urban Meyer is a better coach or has had a better career than Nick Saban. So don't get me wrong. I'm saying that it's an argument, that it's close. I'm not saying he's better or has had a better career. Those are two different things too. I'll take Aaron Rodgers as a quarterback over Tom Brady, but Tom Brady is more accomplished. That's not even debatable. He's much more accomplished. He's got a more accomplished career. And considering Aaron Rodgers' age and his health, he's not going to catch Tom Brady. But if you gave me a healthy Aaron Rodgers versus Tom Brady, I take Rodgers. I think he's a better quarterback. That doesn't mean he's a more accomplished quarterback. We may not know who the best college football coach is out there because they all have different levels of advantages and disadvantages. Who's the most accomplished? Nick Saban. But Nick Saban's a lot older than Urban Meyer. He's had a lot more time to accomplish what he's accomplished. 
at the point that Urban Meyer was Nick Saban's age or vice versa. Nick Saban was Urban Meyer's age. Look at the records. And Urban Meyer has a much better winning percentage than Nick Saban. Not even close. So sense of tumor, I get it. If we, if we had this debate, you would have two strikes on me out of the gate. All you have to do is say six national championships. It's like arguing with the Yankees. <laughs> they got 29, uh, 29, 27 World Series championships. You can't argue. All right, everyone, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to try to select the best game at 3.30 and look around and uh, see what we've got. Uh, Oklahoma, Baylor, and all sorts of stuff going on. So I appreciate you guys uh, jumping on for the live stream. We're going to be here after Ohio State. Might be here, depending on my son coming over with his dog and all sorts of stuff going on with food and family and so forth uh, during the latter portion of the 3.30 games heading into the primetime window. I may be back to get us set for Stanford, Notre Dame, Ohio State, and uh, who are they playing? Ohio State's got a pretty tough game. Yeah, Ohio State and Penn State and the other primetime games uh, after the 3.30 window. Most likely I'm going to be back on around 7 o'clock, and then we'll do it a big late night tonight after the big games and going into the West Coast games late night BYU, Washington, Oregon, Cal, Arizona USC, but I'm going to go watch football. You do the same. Thanks for joining us. And of course, sign up for the newsletter, Mark Rogers TV at Gmail, send your email to Mark Rogers TV at Gmail and use those Amazon links, please to enter Amazon that helps support our channel right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football.